Hey, what's up, everybody? Uh, I'm in Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, we just had the opening of the art exhibit I've been planning and working on for the last couple of months here at a space called Les Communes. And just wanted to give you all a walkthrough and show you all the different projects that have been going on. I'll start with the mushroom one for the mushroom folks to see first. And if you're interested in other remediation and ecological art engagement projects on this part of the world, watch the whole video. All right, so here we are in the mushroom space. And the idea behind this started with the organizer or one of the main uh, people involved with Lake Commune and also its associated artist residency called Utopiana here in Geneva, which was uh, initiated around the idea that these bricks that make up the ground, these wooden bricks, are polluted with unknown substances due to this building being an old factory. And the, the, one of the organizers, Anna, uh, heard about microremediation, wanted to try to see if she could remediate the bricks. The city said no because they own the building, but that inspired this idea of learning about microremediation and presenting it. And it eventually evolved into sort of a uh, ontological question about what is our engagement with our environment, how can we engage with other organisms and work with them to better understand our world and, and have a more active participatory role in how it's transformed in a variety of ways. So this space was designed by myself. We kind of came to a bunch of different ideas about how to present some really fundamental concepts behind mushroom cultivation and microremediation. So it's easy to understand for the uh, new person, but also uh, does something practical and actually resolves something, but presented in hopefully in an interesting way. First, we start with the cultivation area. If for anybody that cultivates using liquid culture practices, submerged fermentation will recognize that we start up top with the liquid mycelium. And then on progressive shelves, we have jars of millet that have been inoculated with that culture. This is uh, pretty much everything in the install is uh, pearl oyster, Pleurotus austriatus, because it's easy to grow and also quite remediative. So these jars um, were inoculated just a little over a week ago. Uh, these about five days ago, and these ones just two days ago. Uh, so it's nice to see the progress of the mycelium and for people to understand what's going on there. And here we've intentionally polluted some soil with uh, used motor oil and then mix that with uh, the soda spawn, a little bit of grain spawn as well for extra nutrition, as well as pasteurized straw for easy, accessible nutrition, known as a co-substrate. When you're doing a remediation project, you want to incorporate something easy for the mushroom to use, a lot of fuel for the fire while it's burning and working on the more complex stuff like the used motor oil. So you can start to see, we only did this just a few days ago. It's kind of sweaty and, and uh, moist in there, but uh, you can kind of see the mushrooms actually popping off behind that fog and grow into the soil. So the idea with this one was sort of trying to replicate an oil spill on a very small scale so people can understand what's one way that we can work with uh, these scenarios that are quite dramatic in a relatively practical and straightforward way. And this is arguably one of the easier remediation practices working with mushrooms, cleaning up chemically polluted um, solid substrates like soil. Uh, over here we have something that's a little bit more on the home front with household waste where we've inoculated uh, cardboard that's been soaked in oil and mixed that with spawn and coffee grounds. So the idea being that uh, obviously coffee grounds are common waste, but then if you have a leaky engine, which a lot of us do, you can put cardboard underneath that when you park your car and then mix these materials together. Again, the coffee providing extra nutrition uh, while the mushroom works on the oily cardboard. And here again, it's a little bit sweaty, uh, but you can see the mushrooms popping off quite well. Um, we had extra spawn, so we capped it with some sawdust and grain spawn just for nice effect. It's going to be a nice thick white cap. Um, not really necessary, we just had extra spawn, we thought it might look nice. And then of course we're weighing it down with bricks, so there's pressure and there's good contact, but kind of not too much. You don't want to restrict airflow because the mushroom won't be able to grow well. And then here's uh, some simple air filters. Probably need to remove the lid and get some of that moisture out. It's been, it gets really warm in there really quickly, um, so the mushroom's really cooking away and doing a lot of uh, metabolism. Uh, this part is for uh, sort of an elaboration off my research with growing mushrooms on cigarette butts. An idea I had years ago, and then uh, maybe I'll link uh, to the YouTube video I did a couple years ago talking about this idea, and now we are furthering the research finally now that I'm done with my book. It's something I've been wanting to, to go deeper with. So these are all tubes that folks made at a workshop the other weekend. And so people did different combinations of coffee grounds, non-smoke filters, smoked filters, uh, and, and soda spawn or grain spawn. So just a few different variables. I left it open. 
wash your hands, some alcohol, and then just spray it on the cigarette butts so they don't get too wet. We did the little test tubes just because it looks nice and, 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 you know, quite beautiful, but you can do larger jars. A lot of people have followed up on this uh, idea that I presented a couple years ago and have done it on larger scales, jars, buckets. Do it on your porch, smoke a cig with your friends, tell them all about it. Here we have just a fruit, basic fruiting environment. Um, any mushroom grower will recognize this type of setup, or at least the principles behind it, which is that we want to, of course, suspend our mushroom block. So this is after the mycelium's grown through a, a primary substrate or a fruiting substrate. And here we're doing a really simple sort of PVC ladder to suspend them. It's a really cheap but quite effective way to make shelving or makeshift sh uh, horizontal space for your fruiting blocks. And we're filtering that or sort of funneling it into this collection tray, uh, the moisture that is. And that's uh, pro being provided in part by this humidifier. Um, it's a cool mist humidifier, so it only provides lots of fresh air, primarily fresh air, and, but it's humid fresh air, so it doesn't dry the mushroom out. Uh, and then a couple times a day, the uh, people that are working at the art space will spray down the interior of the plastic to raise the humidity a bit. Uh, we want about 90% or so to initiate pinning and fruiting, and then you drop it to 80, 85, um, depending on the species to get it to fruit. So again, this is pearl oyster, nice easy mushroom. Um, here, this is a project I helped work with Anna to develop, but it's also a big part of her idea and, and sort of design, which was to grow uh, sort of replacement mushroom bricks. Um, again, sort of building off her initial idea to try to remediate these polluted bricks that make up the art space and evolving that in two different ways. So we wanted something, a dark material. So here we're working with coffee grounds Oysters on coffee, as many of you probably know, is a great uh, growing medium and experiment. And sure enough, the mushroom's growing well. So she'll probably, uh, we were talking about it, she's either gonna build a little fruiting environment over these and open the lids and fruit mushrooms off the top, or maybe just dry them out, let them shrink down a little bit and then pop them out like these. These are not the best examples of my sim didn't grow through. But this is actually some other type of material she was experimenting with before I got here, but it sort of serves the purpose for now, uh, eventually getting many of these bricks popped out. Over here we actually took some of the, one of the bricks and actually shaved it, uh, shaved the contaminated top layers of the wood off, so some are much more contaminated than others. Shaved that and then pasteurized it. Uh, these four are pasteurized, as you can see the mushrooms actually really growing into them. This is, we just did this a, maybe two, three days ago, and it's really growing into it quite well. Pasteurization makes it easier for the mushroom, but of course it, the heat changes the chemicals in the wood, so it's not maybe the most direct representation of the mushroom remediating, but it, it is in a sense. Um, if there's heavy metals in there, which they think there is, it's accumulating those uh, and, and likely breaking down many toxins or, or at least chemicals into something. We don't know what, because we have to test for that. Over here, these four were not pasteurized. You can see the mushroom's not growing quite as quick. So it's a good example of how pasteurization can really help. Um, and then what I'm suggesting is once these ones grow through, and the mushroom adjusts to the, the wood and the, the crude chemicals or some of their byproducts, then adding non-pasteurized. And so it's this incremental baby stepping. Um, it's similar to how I uh, developed training mushroom, oyster mushroom to eat cigarette filters, and it represents the acclimation process of the mushroom to, to new things. Fungi are always adapting to their environment, learning new things, getting better, uh, always teaching us about how to engage and be challenged by our environment. And this is one really great example of how you can uh, learn from that and also learn to work with mushrooms even better. And then over here is a, a chromatograph or a chromatography image uh, made from one of these bricks. This was made by an Italian artist involved in the show that I'll show in a second uh, or in a, little, in a few minutes once we get over there. And uh, I'll explain how that's done, but this is a nice representation of the, the compounds that are in the brick. So we have heavy metals in the center and lighter and lighter uh, molecules and chemicals going out from the center. Um, this is a process used in biodynamics to test soil composition, but you can test really anything, and it's this really beautiful representation of uh, composition, chemical composition. I uh, got the text written out for other folks to see. Um, basically everything I just sort of showed uh, on the walls and on the blocks, but just another way for people to easily read it. All right, go over here. Um, so this is a project by two uh, women from, from Switzerland um, talking or sort of addressing a contaminated lake in Romania 
which was, has been contaminated by uh, aluminum extraction and aluminum industry in the area. And sort of long story short, many different heavy metals and chemicals have been dumped into the water systems there and creating this incredibly toxic red sort of lake, tailings pond essentially uh, of sorts, not, not a mine, but uh, from the industry. So they've done a bunch of things, um, trying to culture different plants and just even the soil itself in the area um, and seeing what microbes grow and just showing people uh, different ways to engage with this pollution. I mean, that's a big theme about this whole project is what does it mean to be surrounded by this toxic environment we've created as humans and what can we do to not avoid it and to not run away from it, but to actually engage. So here's some chromatographies of the soil. So you can really see the different compositions. Uh, this one is done with the water of the, of the space. This is from sort of red dust, basically dried out soil of the space. Um, and this is from the wet mud of the space. But they took it to another level. Um, so here's one of them is a photographer. So here they're using a, uh, well, it's flashing, but uh, it's, it's not showing it right now, but they were putting this 360 camera or this really wide angle camera into the, the water, um, which there looks like it's about to do. But you just sort of swim through the water visually, which is kind of scary. Um, and then this thing, let's see if I can even make this work. Oh, yeah. So I turn this wheel, and what's happening is different samples of the, the water from the lake are getting illuminated um, by uh, a certain fluorescent light or right, a certain frequency. And then in here, we have this whole crazy Arduino system hooked up to a pumps that are based on the intensity of the light. And then based on that intensity of the fluorescence, which translates to how much mercury is in the water, which is one of the main contaminants they're looking at, it will pump out this black water into this pot and sort of a visual representation of you know, pollution occurring. And again, the, the more mercury that's in the water, the, the quicker the water, this water gets dirty. So a really creative um, way to engage. And of course, the idea is this is a, a black box because uh, our pollution is often thought of as a black box. We don't look at it, we don't think about it. We sort of ignore it and, st and stick it away. Um, so you're looking into it um, and engaging with it and thinking about it. Uh, over here is a video projection of a cleansing ritual that was done by a Brazilian medicine woman who came to Ut Utopiana a couple weeks ago and did a cleansing ceremony with these polluted bricks. And this is one of her partners uh, playing the flute. Uh, this whole wrapping is a local photographer artist. Beautiful uh, projections on vinyl. This was an installation, I'll show photos of, of uh, some German artists who went to Cairo, basically compared a waste processing plants from Cairo and Germany, and showing how in Cairo there's a whole 40,000 citizen part of the city that, is, that are Christians that process the waste of the whole city, primarily recycling up to 85 to 90 percent of the material, or hopefully more. The organic waste being fed to pigs, um, which Muslims don't normally touch or raise, so it's Christians that are doing this. Here they're sorting plastic, um, and then they compare it to this German uh, facility, which only recycles, Germany only recycles 30% of its waste, and they burn most of it. So here we're submerged and immersed in this wasteland, and then down here they have this video projection, so I'll try to show you. But basically as I move my hand, um, I can't get both in there, but let's see if it'll do this. You can uh, manipulate the perspective. Okay, so we actually had to, uh, we had to reset the computer, so we'll jump in the edit. Um, but what's pretty amazing is, so with my hand here, and there's some sensors, and there's six directional speakers all around, um, I can change the perspective of this 360 view of this wasteland that you're engaged with. So you're immersed in this waste city and so throughout this video uh, they move through different parts of the town but while you're here you can sort of choose your perspective on it and then also uh, your hand is changing the, the audio variables 
amplitude and the hold and things like that on different frequencies. And the sounds come from, uh, the main sound is from the, the burner in Germany where they just burn trash. So anyway, it's pretty crazy. And as a part of the installation, they also had uh, VR, a VR goggle set up so you could actually uh, put that on and also immerse yourself 360 in this wasteland as well. And then out here we have uh, these chromatographies. Um, actually, I'm not sure what it's called in English, it's what the Italian artist was calling them. Where she went around Geneva and sampled soil from I don't know, about 20 different sites and then did these uh, chromatographic images where again basically this is absorbed to paper and she creates a silver nitrate solution and dissolves the or sort of uh, mixes the soil into it puts a filter paper in the center like a cone and then it, uh, it wicks up the water into the paper and then disperses into the paper from there so it's sort of a you know, wick absorbing wick and then like I say the heavy metals stay in the center and lighter weight uh, chemicals go out and then this is enzymes and different lighter weight uh, nutrients and things. So really incredibly different um, images created, uh, incredibly beautiful. And like, like I say, it's done in biodynamic farming as a way to test soil and sort of read it in a way, just another uh, visual representation. But also a way to sort of see the different chemical makeup. I mean, obviously you can't necessarily translate what this color means or what that color means but you can see the differences in soil and, and maybe even see before and after a remediation project or, or before and after a pollution uh, occurrence, what happens. And then lastly over here, uh, some local architects uh, sampled algae from the streets after a rainfall and uh, basically just collected rainwater from pockets like potholes in the street and then put that into these test tubes that they're aerating, or not test tubes, but uh, large beakers, and to filter the air. The air in this building actually smells. You can sort of smell this chemical uh, something going on when you walk in. So the dirty air is being pumped in through the uh, air stones on the ground, percolating through, and the algae can accumulate uh, the heavy metals in the air that might be floating around and also sort of scrub uh, perhaps other compounds, but it's obviously very beautiful installation and then the fresh air is coming out of a second tube into this uh, tube and you can, there's actually uh, air coming out and so they sample from different streets um, they didn't identify the algae but they, it's likely they think probably very uh, re closely related species, if not the same species in many places. There's three that they got from culture banks, so this is one they know the species of, so it's not from the street, but from a, a known sample. This is from just out in the back alley of the uh, art building that we're in, or the museum. And some different uh, parks and streets and things nearby. So this is cool, and of course the synergy between algae and mushrooms certainly goes into uh, this wasn't pre-planned, but it's always good with the synchronicity that mushrooms and lichens, fungi and algae go together as lichens, and certainly in cultivation practices of the future, we'll incorporate algae to provide the tons of fresh air the mushrooms need while scrubbing the CO2 that they're pumping out. So anyway, uh, thanks everybody for watching all that, and I'll post uh, probably a link to some photos so you can see things more close up and what have you, and share, like, all that kind of stuff.